Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Jose, and I serve here at Northeastern as the Dean of Cultural and Spiritual Life. And we are gathered here this evening to participate in, which I know we all believe, is a very important conversation. It's been a few weeks now, and however, the events that occurred in our nation's capital remain front and center in our national discourse. The storming of the Capitol building, a symbol of our democracy, has shook to the core our foundations of what is possible here in the United States. I remember looking at the television transfix, not believing that which what I was seeing. And while it's apparent today that the guardrails of democracy held firm I think we all felt that they, lob, they wobbled just a little bit, enough to make us all uncomfortable. So an important question arises that we all must deal with. Where do we go from here? What, what's next? Clearly, we must strengthen our commitment to principled leadership, civility, and democracy, no matter our differences in views with, or politics. We have to work together. And as we move forward, from this sad chapter, learn the lessons that need to be learned. That's why I'm so grateful that tonight we have the opportunity to hear from members of our faculty who will help us find our way through what's happened and what we should be doing following that horrendous event. So I hope that all of us will take the chance to participate and make sure that we all learn something that we can come away with and use so that we can participate in making sure that something like this never happens again. I'd like to turn it over to the Dean of CSSH, Dr. Uta Poiger. Thank you so much, Dean Jose. And from me also a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today for this very important conversation. In a series that we have run for the last few years for the university between student affairs and the academic side of the university. This series has a working definition of civic sustainability that I just want to take a couple of moments to remind you of because I do think it is ever so important in today's world. These ambitions include to practice civility while engaging with diverse opinions and difficult conversations, to acknowledge past and present problems, to broaden personal networks, and to find common ground in social action. And I am very glad that during this time of uncertainty, of danger, and also possibility, we are naming key issues that need careful analysis and coherent action. The fight against white supremacy and the policies, social issues, and also governance challenges that have enabled white supremacy. Without saying anything more, let me just really stress how much I look forward to the conversation today. I want to thank our panelists for engaging with us, the audience, in this conversation. And without further ado, I want to turn over to our moderator for tonight, to Dr. O'Brien, the director of the O'Brien Institute for African American Studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Poida, and thank you, Dean Jose, for the introduction. I'm incredibly excited to start us off with this year's important uh, civility series event white supremacy, insurrection, and US democracy. I've been here many years and been through many panels and this has got to be one of the most important conversations that I think we've had on this campus. You will see on your screen in a moment, the many speakers joining us today to discuss the topics of white supremacy, insurrection, and US democracy. Who will, they will introduce themselves shortly these speakers will provide a framework on how to think about these difficult topics and provide insight from their unique perspective for how to address them in our daily lives. Without further delay, I wanna first ask Professor Costas Panagopoulos to start us off. 
Great. Thank you very much to you and to the other uh, panelists for joining us for this important discussion. I'd like to thank Dean Poiger, as well as uh, my colleague, uh, Governor Dukakis, and the Presidential Council on Inclusion and Diversity at Northeastern for hosting this very timely and very important event. And it's my honor to be a part of it and to share some thoughts with you from my perspective about what we've recently experienced um, why uh, it came to be perhaps and what its implications are. So uh, we could um, talk um, at great length uh, about what we experienced on January 6th and what it means. I'd like to um, make five uh, key observations about this uh, and then to, to I'd be happy to talk uh, further in the discussion about um, extensions of these. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that anxiety about uh, diversity and white national identity and multiculturalism in the United States predates Donald Trump. Uh, it, um, he did not create these uh, issues. He helped give rise to them. Uh, and I think that uh, the second observation I would make is that uh, Trump fueled and validated these views, including white supremacy, uh, in part because it might reflect his own personal views, but mainly because he believed it was politically expedient to him. And in so doing, um, he sort of became uh, the, the national cheerleader uh, for these uh, views and for this movement, uh, these individuals who hold these views and espouse them and who had previously had no other mainstream outlet for them uh, and very little validation. The third point I would make is that Donald Trump's, uh, his rhetoric and the lies that he told to the American people incited the insurrection that we saw on January 6th. I think it's important to underscore that. Uh, of course, he's being impeached for that right now and there'll be a trial in the Senate. But the main point there is that words are not innocent, that they can inspire people to action. And sometimes that action can be positive and beneficial to a society. And at other times, things that are said or perhaps unsaid uh, can result very directly in the kinds of actions and choices that people make that have uh, broad and long lasting implications. So I think that this type of rhetoric and um, the complacency of some not to immediately stand up against it in some ways to uh, enable it and facilitate it, um, uh, I think were very much a part of what we saw unfold and what continues to unfold. The fourth point I would make is that um, thankfully, we did not see on inauguration day or really in the aftermath of January 6, uh, a revival of either these actions or much of these views. One, um, it's possible that the military presence in Washington um, discouraged uh, um, insurrectionists from further activities. Uh, clearly uh, the backlash that they got uh, nationally from both sides of the political aisle, as well as in the media and from a wide uh, spread um, uh, diverse uh, multiplicity of uh, reactions that was mostly critical of what had happened may have discouraged some additional activities, but also because um, their leader backed down. Donald Trump um, himself um, uh, faded away somewhat in part because he was um, unwilling to, to double down on what happened and uh, he was giving them cover and credibility. And then a reaction to him was so negative, including among top GOP leaders, that he himself backed down. And that may have inspired uh, some of the uh, insurrectionists themselves to back down and at least to, to hold off on further activity. But the final point I would make is that uh, these individuals and these views are not gone from our society. They remain there, latent, festering be below the surface, uh, and they will be there ripe for any other leader or circumstances to activate in the future. Uh, and that means that we have to grapple with these issues as a country. We have to uh, ensure that, um, uh, that these are not actions that are tolerated uh, in our society uh, and that we have a national conversation about the things that gave rise to them and to, uh, to be explicit in our condemnation of them. But their potential danger, I think, is highlighted by 
just some brief empirical uh, evidence that I'd like to share with you from a uh, nationally representative survey that I conducted uh, in the uh, before these events in December, uh, conducted December 11th through 16, 2020, uh, before the events of January 6th, but after what happened on election day and its aftermath. We asked people um, how much they agree with four different assertions. The first assertion was simply that whether or not they agreed that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. Uh, unsurprisingly, 97% of Democrats said they agreed, but only 28% of Republicans, which means over seven in 10 Republicans believed that Joe Biden did not win the 2020 election. We asked them whether they believed there was widespread fraud in the 2020 election. Only 7% of Democrats believed there was widespread fraud, but 81% of Republicans believed that there was widespread fraud in 2020. Uh, that is a number that is much larger than just the Trump base, the solid Trump base that we have uh, seen uh, over the course of his presidency. We asked people to tell us whether they accept the results of the 2020 election. And again, 96% of Democrats said they accept the results, but only 34% of Republicans. Uh, that is quite a sizable share of the Republican electorate that refuses to accept the results of the 2020 election. And finally, we asked them whether they agree that they would support a peaceful transition of power. 96% of, of Democrats said that they would support a peaceful transition of power. But three weeks before the January 6th incidents, 72% of Republicans uh, did not agree that they would support a peaceful transition of power. This is the backdrop against which the events of January 6th unfolded. And these views uh, remain uh, prevalent in our society and may have even been calcified and may have ossified in the aftermath of January 6th. And so I think uh, that we are in a precarious moment as a nation in which a sizable segment of our population and particularly within uh, the um, constellation of Republican sympathizers, a large chunk of them uh, simply do not believe that Joe Biden is legitimately elected and would not even agree to, a, to support a peaceful transition of power. Uh, it is very, very difficult for democracy to be sustained long term in this country against that kind of a backdrop. And that's why conversations like this one are so important for us to have and for us to really get to the bottom of it. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of my views and I look forward to the conversation. And we'll pass it over to Professor Brunston. Thank you very much. Uh, I too am very excited uh, about contributing to the ongoing conversation. And I'd like to draw everyone's attention to an image that appeared uh, alongside Heather Shabbat's January 15th News at Northeastern article. And I'll give our tech people time to put that up. And so as the previous comments uh, were directed at the January 6th event, and you'll see in the image, uh, the split screen image, the January 6th events on, I believe is gonna be on your left, and an earlier Black Lives Matter protests that took place uh, also in Washington, D.C. And you can see the two uh, different levels of police response, but also police presence. And you can also see that the characteristics of the uh, protesters slash demonstrators were also uh, different. And I'd also like you to note the photo credits to give the photojournalists a full uh, recognition of their work. So in uh, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson's Kerner Commission warned that our nation is moving toward two societies. And as this picture illustrates, one black, one white, separate and unequal. In a nutshell, blacks and whites historically and presently live in vastly different social worlds. Therefore, sociologists have faced a difficult challenge when attempting to separate the impact of race from that of attributes, attributes of disadvantaged communities in general, uh, including rates of poverty, female-headed households, joblessness, and certainly incarceration rates uh, to explain these unsettling and different police practices. And uh, you can take the image down if you like. Thank you very much. And this is mainly because the urban disadvantage that's found in the poorest black communities 
is ecologically unmatched. And what does that mean? That means that a poor black person typically lives under conditions of concentrated disadvantage that most equally poor white persons do not experience in this country. Uh, this summer's national unmasking of the volatile relationship between police and black citizens that we saw in the aftermath of George Floyd's untimely murder confirms that the Kerner Commission's dire uh, premonition about growing racial strife and inequality was insightful. And the American public has grown increasingly interested in addressing allegations of widespread racially biased policing practices, a troubling matter for a society that tirelessly promotes but repeatedly falls short of honoring its commitment to the equitable treatment of all its citizens. For example, patterns of discriminatory policing strike an especially harsh chord with those black citizens who view contemporary policing strategies through a historical lens. Uh, historians and legal scholars have established that in addition to functioning as slave patrols, surveilling and limiting blacks physical movement, early law enforcement officers were instrumental in a wide range of illegal activities, including mob action, torture, and countless killings of freed Blacks. Uh, fast forward, pundits have frequently referred to George Floyd's murder as a critical inflection point for a beleaguered society that is uh, forever haunted by its poor race relations. And Mr. Floyd's gut-wrenching death uh, with its resulting barrage of corporate statements condemning racism together with new leadership in Washington that unapologetically campaigned on meaningful criminal justice reform offers a critical opportunity for change. Our gravely fractured nation is at a crossroads once again and does not have the luxury of waiting for yet another blue ribbon panel to issue policy recommendations like nearly all of the 50 something plus guidelines issued by the 2015 Presidential Task Force on 21st Century Policing, which were ignored uh, by the next administration. So again, as the previous uh, speaker and colleague noted, that these are issues that continue to be uh, ones that we grapple with as a country. And there are certain events and flashpoints that make them you know, much more necessary. But as we've said several times in, in several conversations, particularly in the Northeastern community, and I believe and, and honored that we have grown increasingly comfortable with having difficult conversations, um, I suspect much like the conversation that we'll have tonight and that we are learning from each other and with each other. And I'm very encouraged by that. So I hand it off to my colleague, uh, Dr. Foucault Wills. Thank you, Dr. Brinson. Um, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with my fellow panelists, uh, Dr. O'Brien, all our organizers, and the audience that I know is there even if we can't see you. Uh, this is a super important conversation and the, the angle that I wanna bring to it is my expertise on online communication and particularly online communication by and about folks from marginalized communities. So it's through that lens that I saw the events of January 6th. Uh, it wasn't shocking um, or surprising to me to see this enraged mob of white supremacists literally breaking down the door of democracy to our collective aghast in horror. For many of us who've studied online communication for some time, the events are not unexpected. Uh, they're the culmination of decades of hateful rhetoric, coordinated harassment, and deliberate media manipulation by a motley assortment of racists, misogynists, and hate-filled trolls lumped together under the unseemly umbrella of the alt-right. The origins of this violent extremism date back to at least the 1990s when Judith Doneth noted the presence of trolls in Usenet groups. These trolls would deliberately harass newcomers in hopes of baiting them into well-worn arguments with established users. This is both a form of entertainment and a tool for discouraging the wrong type of newcomers. And trolling culture evolved to deploy ever more offensive language and imagery, including unsurprisingly racist, misogynist, queerphobic, 
and other shocking inflammatory discourse. By the mid 2000s, trolls and their sympathizers found a home in the anonymous message boards, 4chan, and subsequently 2chan, 8chan, and a number of other chans, where an arms race of offensive and obscene communication has pushed out all but the most hardened users on purpose. When challenged, the chan trolls will alternately claim that they're just joking, or they'll invoke their First Amendment rights to justify their behavior. This twin convergence of gaslighting and legal protection created the dangerous conditions for Gamergate, an online movement of targeted violence and harassment against women in the gaming industry. To make a long story very short, a group of 4chan users strategically engineered Gamergate in 2014 by gathering support from a variety of otherwise disconnected constituents, including gamers, men's rights activists, and conservative political commentators, to execute a relentless harassment campaign that included, among other things, chasing women from their homes, sending death and rape threats to them at work, and threatening to detonate bombs at their public speaking events. When the women targeted in Gamergate asked law enforcement for help, their concerns were largely dismissed. They were told to get off their computers or not feed the trolls by presumably simply accepting the abuse coming at them and ceasing to defend themselves, their families, their careers, or their property. Similarly, Gamergate victims were dismissed by platforms such as YouTube, Reddit, and Twitter who refused to ban accounts or even remove content in most cases, including startlingly after these platforms hired these exact women as paid consultants to help them improve the health and safety of the platforms. So with all that in mind, I read the events of January 6th and saw the complacency of law enforcement, these multi-billion dollar corporations, and the sort of extreme right internet commentary that women, people of color, queer folk, and others have been warning, about, uh, warning us about for years. Did we know exactly what would happen three weeks ago? No, we didn't. And yet, what happened is so recognizable and the response is so legible that they seem as familiar as they are shocking. So where do we go from here? I agree with my fellow panelists wholeheartedly that these toxic impulses are not new, nor are they likely to go away with the transition to a new administration. At the same time, I'm going to advocate for the power of deplatforming. As of today, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, and Reddit have all made small but significant moves to remove extreme content and prevent the future coordinated attacks like the ones we saw in Gamergate and we saw on January 6th. The work is of course far from done. And in my opinion, a regulatory framework for social media companies is long overdue. And yet breaking this chain of amplification, particularly from the big mainstream social media platforms to traditional news media coverage, which has an expansive reach, is a powerful tool for disbanding coordinated hate groups and limiting their ability to plan attacks. It has historically also had the residual benefit of reducing this language overall on the platforms, which is to say, when we ban these kinds of people in this kind of language, it removes toxic content from networks in general. So if we wanna reduce the chances of something like this happening again, platforms must choose or they need to be compelled by policy or social pressure to do that. Great, and we'll pass it on to Professor Williams. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's distressing to be here. <laughs> and I honestly don't know what to say about January 6th. Nothing in law school prepared me for that. I can read the Insurrection Act, um, but uh, it did not prepare me for that moment. Um, and so what I thought I would talk about is the historical memory that it evoked in me, um, a sense of familiarity that many of us have felt, even though we end up feeling stunned that it happened this way at this time in this way. Um, but honestly, looking at it, it felt like a SWAT team was invading a house based on bad information because of a tip from a friend of a friend of an informant who knew a guy. So I saw all these people really excited and they're all hopped up. And at the same time, they're not quite sure where they're going. 
or what they're going to do. But they are just so certain that they own this moment. Whatever happens, they own this. And it was that sense that really made me think about the ownership and the confidence um, of being able to survive this moment and to do so without particular consequence. And so that chilling connection to an alternative scenario, I think is how we live history from the inside out. And it was followed in me by another connection, much more benign, which I felt as a kind of my own inner commentary on the, on, on the, on the dailiness of this, on the complicity of how normalizing other things that happen in this world are that might give rise to this moment. And that was my recollection of sitting in an airport one day. Um, it was snowing and so I, my, my flight was light, late and so I had, I had lunch. Um, and on the other side of the little uh, table, uh, there was a sort of little diner divider. I was listening to a big jovial man talking about his son's wedding on a former cotton plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. And the man was discussing very ordinary things, the weather, the bride, how much wine was served, what music they played. And he said everyone was dressed in antebellum clothing and it was so much fun. And I remember sitting there with my chowder growing cold and all I could think of was they're dancing on graves. And then quick on its heels, I, I, I wondered what would happen if I sort of leaned over and started telling him about my very different perception. And I could imagine him calling me politically wrecked and threatening and hostile even. But this is the memory that came back to me after January 6th. I thought of the poet Carolyn Randall Williams, who is the great, great granddaughter of Edmund Pettus, the storied Confederate general, the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, the man for whom Selma's Bloody Sunday Bridge is named. And Carolyn Randall Williams wrote a, an op-ed back in June saying, you want a Confederate monument? My body is a Confederate monument. And she observed that there are those who dismiss the hardships of the past and the violence of it. They imagine a world of benevolent masters and speak with misty eyes of gentility and honor and land. They deny plantation rape or explain it away as a question, or they question the degree of frequency with which it occurred. To those people, it is my privilege to say, I am proof. And so this repressed history of interconnected, violent, black and white family relation is an ongoing trauma that exists with us and between us. And the pain of it echoes across generations. Nearly all African-Americans of, uh, except for the most recent uh, arrivals are the thoroughly mixed progeny of white slaveholders. The violence of whose paternity is variously misperceived as biological stain, unfortunate mutation, legal fiction, uh, or even some kind of love story. But this man was remembering his child's wedding in Charleston, and the city of Charleston is known for its beautifully preserved plantations, colonial buildings, tourism, destination weddings, but its architectural charm rests on the extraordinary wealth of the slave trade, and its history is marked by slave rebellion after slave rebellion and the violent caution thereof. And the fear of insurrection was so great that the Security Act of 1739, so this has been going on a long, long time, specifically required all white men to carry guns to church. Like many places in the south, Southern United States, they were afraid of the consequences of those laws passed that prohibited slaves from earning money, from growing their own food, from practicing religion, from learning to read, from even marrying. And so, the languorous romance of plantation life in the deep south of ladies in ruffled dresses and gentlemen in riding boots sipping mint juleps is a fairy tale particularly popularized by Gone with the Wind. Um, that came out in 1936 and it has had a disproportionate global influence in imagining the passionate seductions of antebellum south and the tragic lost cause of the confederacy. And despite all kinds of abolitionist narratives, <laughs> Um, Gone with the Wind has won the Pulitzer Prize, um, and a Harris poll found that as recently as 2014, it was the second favorite book among all American readers right after the Bible. 
And it wasn't until the global outrage of the death of George Floyd, just this past spring, that Americans began to rethink the book's oversized influence. And HBO actually decided that they were gonna pull it off the air until they got some historical context and had some discussion to accompany or precede the showing of it. But I think the real historical context is that part of Gone with the Wind's popularity to begin with back in the 30s came from its positioning as a feel-good follow-up to the more controversial and violent defense of the Confederacy presented in Thomas Dixon's novel, The Klansman, whose subtitle is also about romance. The subtitle of The Klansman is A Historical Romance of the Ku Klux Klan. And its film adaptation, Birth of a Nation, in 1915. And I'll just read you a quick quote from Dixon's book. Prior to the Civil War, the capital was ruled by an aristocracy founded on brains, culture, and blood. Now a new Negro electorate controlled by city government and gangs of drunken Negroes, a new mob of onion-laden uh, onion breath mixed with perspiring African odor has become the symbol of American democracy. It culminates with the celebratory descriptions of the Ku Klux Klan's victory over Yankee scalawags, carpetbaggers, and reforms of the Freedmen's Bureau with a violent and instant quiet death in the dead, executed in the dead of night without warning, mercy, or appeal. And so I think this depiction of newly freed slaves as rapists, fools, thieves, and murderers in Birth of a Nation is widely credited with spurring a deadly resurgence of Klan activity throughout the United States, resulting in increased violence against Blacks and the passage of Jim Crow laws legalizing segregation. And given this social context, Gone with the Wind offered, and really until this day, the sentimental bomb of plucky and endearing Confederate heroism. And this palliative characterization has only grown through the decades and presently underwrites much of the re revisionist discourse about race relations in our supposedly post-racial moment. So all of this takes me back to, again, the airport in which I was sitting listening to this father of the bride and his companion and they seemed like good people as they were having this discussion. Really good people. I liked them initially before I heard about the plantation. They were happy and so racially innocent and they were swaddled in a bubble of bliss, however radioactive it might, might have appeared to me. And I knew that if I were tr trying to open a discussion with them, I might be called PC or threatening, unruly, out of place. And it really struck me as I sat there that we were living in two such completely separate halves of American experience and the little glass divider between us on that table. Really, we could see each other through that glass divide, but we really were living in alternative universes. Our so different halves of American history, our so different halves of American experience. Wow. Thank you. That was wonderful and incredibly insightful by all of our uh, panelists. And so I want to remind the audience to post questions in the chat that we will share during the call this part of the conversation that we will have. But I will start us off with a question and uh, Professor Williams, if you'll allow me to um, follow up with your conversation. You know, clearly we all understand the difficulty of the time that we're in and the kinds of um, anxiety that this was provoking. And the question I have is in trying to have these conversations uh, with people who may disagree or obviously see these things in a, a much different way. What's the um, strategy, and, and maybe this is a question for all of all of our panelists, that we could use to engage in these conversations, particularly with our students? Uh, 
Um, that, that, that's addressed to me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, oh, well, each panelist, but I wanted oh, you to okay. start us off on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I do think that there are two kinds of conversations that we have to have. One is probably with the people who have already been sucked into sort of the stochastic terrorist model uh, to which both Costas and Brooke referred, um, that, that you really are in your own echo chamber and that's particularly enhanced at this moment by technology. Um, but it may also be the traumatic re reiteration of those people who are still alive who witnessed lynchings um, and who, who, who grew up with family histories of extraordinary violence um, that gets passed down in generations. And that's a different kind of conversation, it seems to me. Um, and I am not certain that my sitting down trying to dissuade somebody from voting for, for, for Donald Trump is, um, is precisely the way to go, and I do think it's a technological issue. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's and, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a problem rooted in our collective trauma. That's not my expertise. I do think that when I talk to students about it, I am talking to those people who are more at the end of, you know, who, 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 who that we are living in a, in a great American divide, but are still people of goodwill, who may have a very different sense and may get upset about whether or not I am, you know being too politically correct. But still, if we walk into a room and I try when I, when I am with students and I have the power to set the, the frame of a conversation um, to bring large boxes of Kleenex and ask mm -hmm. everybody to have a commitment um, to be patient with one another and to listen mm -hmm. through what hurts their feelings um, mm -hmm. and to listen past that and to come back to the conversation when it gets too mm -hmm. hard, but to break away, but mm -hmm. to come back. And then I also have one, another rule. Um, please do not run off and put it on slate before the class is over. <laughs> you know, I think that that's another technological intervention where somebody gets offended yeah. and they immediately put it into, um, into, into and, and that you know, bursts the walls of any ability mm -hmm. to create trust and to learn from one another if we are too afraid mm -hmm. to make mistakes, if we're too afraid um, to, uh, uh, to lower our defenses. So those, those, those mm -hmm. that, that's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it certainly doesn't answer the larger question of this moment, but yeah, Kleenex. Uh, <laughs> yes, Brooke, I would be interested in your thoughts on that question. Yeah, I mean, I, my comments, I think largely echo Dr. Williams's comments. Uh, so the, you know, the research on communication and persuasion is crystal clear on this, that the way you mm -hmm. persuade someone else uh, to change their mind is through a common connection. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so you find some common ground that you can all agree on. In some ways, you know, I'd be interested to hear what Dr. Panagopoulos finds in his next survey, but in some ways, you know, the, the visual of kind of smashing the walls of the Capitol may in fact prove to be some kind of common ground, at least for some people, that there was a line mm -hmm. there that, that mm -hmm. it's my non-empirical sense anyway. Mm -hmm. that, that we could more people collectively agreed that was not okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe that's our common ground. Uh, the, the only other thing I'll add before I hand it off to someone else is that, uh, you know, as someone who studies communication by and for marginalized groups, uh, this is a real role for allies and accomplices that, that not mm -hmm. everyone can have these conversations and not everyone should be burdened with these conversations. So, so if you're the person who has the capacity to engage in these conversations, some of which are with people who want to do other humans violence, uh, mm -hmm. then step up. And if you're a person who can't do that, uh, be it perhaps because the violence is directed at you, it's also okay to step back um, and mm -hmm. not have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Costas, did you wanna? Well, I could chime in uh, because I also um, study political psychology, and I think that um, you know it's important to acknowledge that uh, many of these biases, at least social identity theorists will tell us, are are innate. Uh, they're part of the human condition, and perhaps for evolutionary or other social reasons, we. Uh, adhere to um, various I identities about ourselves and then uh, we see the world in uh, or we can tend to see the world in kind of an us versus them way uh, that our mm. in-group biases um, cause us to discriminate against people uh, and to dislike um, those who we perceive to be different. 
Um, but mm -hmm. I also think it's important that those identities that we recognize that those identities are nested, right? We can see ourselves as blacks and whites and liberals and, or conservatives, uh, as Democrats or Republicans, but we can also see ourselves uh, as Americans, right? Sharing, um, co finding common ground and sharing a belief in this country and what it stands for, et cetera. And I think that uh, focusing on directing our attention uh, to, uh, as, a, as, as both um, uh, Professor Foucault Wells and Patricia, Professor Williams have said, focusing on what we have in common and those things that we can support together uh, as a nation, I think is important. Uh, but there are challenges to doing that because there are those uh, who for political or or, or uh, other gain, right? Um, want to keep us separate, want to keep us distinct, want to keep us apart, want to keep us compartmentalized and to develop, uh, you know, uh, niches that um, people can profit from. And we have to fight against that every chance we can get um, so that we can try to focus on uh, what unites us as uh, Joe Biden and many others have said, then what sets us, mm -hmm. us apart. Mm-hmm. Um, Rod, I have a, another question I want you to start us off with, but I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to chime in on, on the question about how we discuss these issues. Oh, sure. Thanks. And I'll borrow mm -hmm. from, you know, each of my colleagues had uh, very poignant things to say. And I, and I would say that, you know, a recognition, certainly patience is important. Uh, empathy, uh, I would add, and empathy in the sense that we have to recognize or work to recognize other people's pain, even if we don't understand it, or even if it's mm -hmm. true, even if their pain is a result of them buying into a false ideology, uh, but there's mm -hmm. a source of pain that is that is there that they feel is very real to them, and, and I think we shouldn't just be dismissive of it because we think that it's misplaced. Mm -hmm. uh, a question from the, the chat, uh, and this one is for you, Rod. Uh, to the point of addressing 21st century policing, and the Obama administration's recommendations that borrow components of the Kerner Commission's findings, the 116th Congress drafted various bills across a four year span addressing the discrepancies of policing that died on the floor by the former Senate Majority Leader and arguably the Conservative Party. Uh, this question invites the panelists to discuss this perspective on ways to implement active recommendation on ways the federal, state, and local institution arenas can resuscitate remnants of those bills and to improve police community relations. Uh, for example, uh, Home Rule 7120 Justice and Policing Act. I'll just say, you know, as I mentioned in my comments, that you know we have become overly reliant on commissions and panels. Mm -hmm. And and I think that as a as a society, we know uh, what needs to be done, but is there a political will to do it? And do we hold people accountable uh, that, that have, that we've entrusted with this meaningful change and reform? And so it just goes, to not that we shouldn't try, but this, you know, again, I think the reoccurring theme of today is that we've all seen whatever movie that we're talking about, we've seen it before. And so the same is mm -hmm. police reform. You know, we've had, you know, discussions about uh, unequal treatment at the hands of police, you know, for decades, if not centuries. But yet, as a, we haven't had the political will as a society to do anything about it. So I don't have any, like, mm -hmm. I don't have any hopeful uh, the, optimism to offer uh, other than the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. We certainly have reached different turning points uh, in society, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. that kind of marriage of turning points and uh, political will, but also activism. And as I talk about her mm -hmm. pain, that you know, people you know protesting in the street is you know mm -hmm. certainly reflective of that pain and that we should seek to understand and mm -hmm. and not to think that we can address all of this pain and anguish, you know, with the police reform bill. Yeah. Now, are there Police departments that you know of that do better with the police community relations than others? Yeah, I, th I think the simple answer would be yes, some do a better job than others. But, but again, that doesn't mean that they do a satisfactory job. So, you know, mm -hmm. it depends on what our, what our expectations are as a nation. So is not you know, killing an unarmed black or brown person 
mm-hmm. applaud that or should that be our expectation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Professor Wells, back to you. And I'm gonna try to see if I can combine these two questions. Uh, but it, can you speak to the idea that the platforming makes it harder to track the plans of the alt-right groups? Um, one also says, um, I'm comfortable with Amazon kicking Parler off and Twitter kicking individuals off, but do we risk corporations being too comfortable controlling speech as opposed to uh, government doing so? How do we strike a balance? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, So I'm going to start with the second one. And uh, I mean, my my answer is absolutely not. Like, I'm not comfortable allowing uh, private corporations to make these decisions. And here's why, um, that when you have a platform the size of YouTube or the size of Facebook or even Twitter, which is a bit smaller, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. have so many people participating that your policy decisions become kind of quasi public policy decisions, right? And so we have Mm -hmm. these people um, inside these corporations who aren't elected, who aren't beholden to us, Mm -hmm. who frankly, don't even really pay taxes. Uh, They offshore a lot of their profits and aren't paying into the systems of education and civic development that we might, you know, want in order to counteract some of the toxic sludge on those platforms. And they get to Mm -hmm. make these policy decisions, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, why I firmly think we are long overdue to revise some of the Mm -hmm. existing policy that protects all of the speech that exists on those platforms or, or at least, uh, you know, makes it so that they don't be, they are not held accountable. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, not for nothing, historically, the threat of government policy and regulation has prompted private industries to develop industry standards and more transparency and so on around media Mm -hmm. content. So I I think even the threat would move the needle in the right direction. Um, Mm -hmm. On Mm -hmm. whether or not it makes it harder to track, uh, I would say, Yes, I mean, in some ways, it's obvious that if people are, you know, on Gab organizing a coup, um, it's easier to see what they're doing. In other ways, it Mm -hmm. also makes it harder for them to coordinate. So so the way Mm -hmm. that you reach massive audiences is not, frankly, by coordinating inside 4chan, right? So that's a tiny Mm -hmm. portion of the population. I I think most of us would agree that it's very extreme. It's Mm -hmm. through this coordinated manipulation that comes from the chans through the mainstream social media platforms and ultimately to the more partisan uh, media and then to the mainstream media. And that's where Mm -hmm. the real danger is. So if you disrupt Mm -hmm. the ability to coordinate on the the mainstream social media platforms, you really do significantly disrupt that amplification and coordination process. So yes, it's a little harder to monitor, but I'm not convinced that making it harder to monitor is a bad trade-off for us to make. Mm -hmm. Um, Pat, here's an interesting question. Puerto Rico has declared a state of emergency addressing gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Is this a feasible example that states could follow suit or even nationwide federally to address the issue of white supremacy? Why or why not, or, or could even Northeastern declare something like that? I, I don't know the terms. I, I would really have to read. I, I, I hadn't heard about that, and I would very much like to, mm-hmm. to know more about what the legal structure of that, that might be. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, we do have civil rights laws. We do have um, laws that address um, uh, insurrection <laughs> and that address mm-hmm. racial terror. Um, and the, again, I, I agree with Rod, or I mean, I'm Professor Brunson, forgive me for, <laughs> um, that this sorry. is, you know, that this is, um, but, but, but this, it is the will to enforce this or to recognize it as falling under those laws. Um, and mm-hmm. there is something peculiar in its intensity at this moment that I think goes back to the question of technology. Um, mm-hmm. This always comes back to the First Amendment. (laughs) And so we live in a world in which corporations have First Amendment freedom of expression, (laughs) number one. Mm. Second of all, corporations are not just private. Um, Their entire ethical structure is an obligation to their stakeholders. 
So they are for profit. Mm -hmm. These organizations that are supposedly ungovernable under our constitution, um, but governing us in the name of the first amendment are really profit making machines. And it is very mm -hmm. profitable to have these huge debates and falling out all over the internet. I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's um, there's a conflict of interest um, mm -hmm. in all of this. And then finally, I think that uh, there is a real tension in a moment where the rights of not just free speech have been expanded to entities like corporations, mm -hmm. but the Second Amendment since the since, since, since the last 20 years or so, or, or I guess a little longer than that, uh, since the Heller mm -hmm. decision, um, has really become an individual right. And so mm -hmm. you have the right to bear arms being interpreted mm -hmm. as though it were a part of the First Amendment, an extension of the freedom of expression, of freedom of expression, mm -hmm. and those are the battles you mm -hmm. see in lawmakers wanting to bring guns into the into the into the halls of power. But I think that there's a big distinction to be made between governance, constitutional governance structures, uh, which are beyond price, which are beyond money, beyond profit, and which are designed to serve people um, mm -hmm. and um, and to enable human flourishing and structures that are that are really designed themselves to be ungovernable as so much as, as so much mm -hmm. as of, of these companies do and uh mm -hmm. and and our, our you know their first obligation is to make profit before it is to make happy customers mm -hmm. even before, in, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a constitutional sense so mm -hmm. yeah uh professor panagopoulos <laughs> i'll be more formal and uh <laughs> analyzing what happened on January 6th, uh, the insurrection, we often focus on the symbolic features of the event and much less so on the material. Do you have insights to offer on the material motivations, explanations of the efforts to suppress black votes, steal back the vote, uh, revolt if need be? The puppet masters frequently have material economic motivations and be curious to know what they are. Sure. Well, I think uh, one of the reasons we are focusing on the symbolic features of the January 6th events is because um, they're very important in terms of uh, the signal that they send. What is the message that's going to come forth from not only what happened on January 6th, but how the country reacted mm -hmm. to it. And that's why I think it's crucial to focus on, on, um, on those things because uh, you know, let's face it. I think that those uh, that that incident uh, was largely symbolic. I don't think that there was really any, uh, you know, realistic expectation that these insurrectionists would overthrow the American government or even get Donald Trump somehow back into the White House. I think that the main point was to show America that they're out there, that they're willing to fight for their views, that they're willing to, you know, storm the Capitol and to create this havoc and chaos to remind America uh, that they're out there. Uh, they're lurking, um, you know, not only in the backgrounds, but in plain sight, uh, and they're willing to take action to, um, to fight for their uh, views. So I think that that was a, sin a signal that they were sending that was mainly symbolic. Uh, and then the country's reaction to that uh, is also important because um, they did not get the kind of embrace that they may have anticipated. They didn't get the kind of support they didn't have Donald Trump and his kids walking down Pennsylvania Avenue with them to the Capitol as he promised he would. They were on their own. And then they were on their own after the fact. Mm -hmm. I was struck by Pat's, um, uh, by Professor Williams, uh, pardon me, uh, you know, um, uh, description of the ownership that they took. I, I agree. I think they, they definitely took ownership on that day. But where have they been since mm -hmm. then? They're sort of, uh, they're mm. not, uh, you know, they've largely uh, disappeared into the shadows because they're being pursued by law enforcement and perhaps even also by public opinion. They reminded me, since you also mentioned the Bible, Professor Williams, of the biblical description 
you know, of the Apostle Peter after uh, uh, Christ had been arrested, who, you know, professed, uh, you know, before that, that he would never abandon him and betray him and deny him. And then as soon as that happened, he started denying him left and right uh, and uh, uh, claimed no association with him whatsoever. At the moment, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what's happening in the, uh, you know, in the social media um uh, platforms where they can still exchange views, but at least in the mainstream of American politics, uh, they're not getting the kind of reception that they may have anticipated. Uh, and that to me is, I think, very important. Now, on the question of the material uh, motivations, um, suppressing black votes, etc., cetera, uh, there's a long history and a long tradition of that in this country. And what's, what's peculiar about that is, you know, these votes are being suppressed in part because these voters are black voters and, and other minorities, but also because of the kinds of policies and the kinds of candidates that these voters uh, would be supporting at the ballot box. And what's peculiar to me is that for many of these people who are either trying to suppress their vote uh, or who are okay with their votes being suppressed, they share um, common, at least common economic interests in policies that would mm. help them, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. they just refuse to see that common ground that by by uh, trying to suppress their votes, they might be suppressing policies that in some ways benefit them themselves. Uh, and so they're they're very short sighted and may not even um, uh, fully grasp the personal connection that some of these efforts have in uh, in their own well-being. Mm. Um, just a, a quick follow up question. Uh, your statistics for some was terrifying. Um, is there a way to develop a consensus around facts uh, or around the truth? Um, yeah, well. Uh, uh, or around the legitimacy of the election? Yeah, well, uh, facts have really taken a beating uh, in the past four years, right? Uh, the spread of misinformation mm -hmm. and allegations about fake news and facts, uh, alternative facts, uh, uh, you know, has been um, a hallmark of the Trump administration. Uh, but really, we had seen this mm -hmm. developing even before Donald Trump around things like vaccine use and other types of um, conspiracy mm -hmm. theories that had been, uh, you know, really gone mainstream, really, have come, come out of the woodwork and into the mainstream. Uh, it, this is something that I've explored in my own research. And one of the more striking patterns that we have found in some recent um, uh, studies that I have published with um, colleagues is that uh, this uh, belief in conspiracies, not only about specific conspiracy theories, but a general conspiratorial outlook, uh, just kind of a general um, distrusting, uh, you know, looking for conspiracies everywhere, seems to be um, largely associated with a conservative ideology, right? Uh, and that's something mm -hmm. that we have to uh, which may even have genetic or evolutionary origins. And so we have to uh, uh, battle against our own nature as human beings to address some of these questions because they might predispose us in very compelling ways, as I was discussing earlier about bias and other things. Uh, those things might be so deeply ingrained in us as human beings and who we are, you know, what makes us tick, uh, and even our genetic and evolutionary foundations that really to address them is going to take is going to be a, an uphill battle because in some ways we're going against our own nature as human beings, but yet to solve some of these problems mm -hmm. in the long term, uh, that's exactly what we have to do. Mm. Um, Professor Wells, do you think that social media can be used to help create some of the consensus? Yeah, for sure. So, so look, my main area of research is online activism, and uh, mm -hmm. we could, I could rattle off a whole series of internet mm -hmm. hashtags that that became massive social movement campaigns. So, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. Me Too, Girls Like Us, uh, the Arab Uprising, and so on, um, have all created. Uh, massive opportunities for conversations, right? And, and so, so I know mm -hmm. some folks immediately think, oh, but what have they really, really done? Right? <laughs> what, what's mm -hmm. the impact of those different mm -hmm. hashtags? And I think the fact that those words, those little phrases are even legible to most people in the audience mm -hmm. is a significant mm -hmm. change, right? So Black Lives Matter is mm -hmm. not a thing that mainstream America was talking about 10 years ago. Um, 
And now mm -hmm. we talk about it. Not only do we talk about it, we see it mentioned in, you know, inaugural addresses. We see it mentioned in media uh, campaigns. We see it painted on streets of major cities. Is that the change mm -hmm. that we're looking for? Of course not. We're not at the end of this mm -hmm. process. And yet we can yeah. come around, we see massive changes in people's opinion about whether or not police violence is a problem, um, you know, mm -hmm. in under a decade. So, you know, those processes of coming to consensus or coming to new norms and expectations, as Dr. Brunson said, um, are not gonna happen overnight, but they do happen in a generation, mm -hmm. right? So, so I do mm -hmm. think social media can play a role in those things, just as mm -hmm. bad ideas come out of social media, good ideas can come out and be, um, you know, promoted and advocated for as well. Um, Professor Brunson, I have a question that was emailed in early. Um, and the question was, well, first it's presented as a, as a scenario. Uh, imagine a front facing wall of the NU police department station had a mural painted by students that included a thin blue line in the American flag, black with a blue line. Other students complain about the flag's presence on the school property because they consider it a symbol of white supremacy. How would, how would one go about moderating a debate over a proper response to something like that? Uh, and, and this question comes from someone who is actually dealing with a real life situation like this. Yeah, and so whatever I say, I'm sure would not uh, uh, fully remedy uh, the situation or provide you know, some clear direction. Mm -hmm. But I think it would go back to the earlier comments that we had about how do we listen to one another? You know, how do we express empathy and particularly with views that we may not agree with? And so I think that is a starting point uh, that you know we can look mm -hmm. at. And again, we can look at two symbols. And as uh, Professor William talked about the conversation. Uh, that she overheard at the airport that someone else who didn't have her background and understanding and experiences may have uh, joined them in, you know, joined the, the diners, their fellow diners in romancing about the, the antebellum South. Uh, so we just have to recognize that we can see situations, uh, symbols, et cetera, and they may not mean the same things to everyone. Somebody may see them as mm comforting, whereas others may see, you know, they may be trauma inducing or cause people distress. So I would say again, just to, you know, work very hard to make sure that we practice as, you know, Professor Williams said, patience, but also practice empathy and to understand that, mm -hmm. you know, may not see the world exactly as we do, uh, but they, they, that we all have a right to coexist in this world. Mm -hmm. Um, and Professor Williams, uh, this question for you, the concept of white privilege and Macintosh's invisible knapsack yeah. of advantages was an important intervention in getting beyond an I am not racist response, which uh, Kendi has advanced with the concept of all of us needing to be actively anti-racist. What are your thoughts on how white people could begin to experientially confront the other America across the divide and stop universalizing their experience as normative? Um, I, I, I do think that, it, again, this, this just as a starting point requires not taking the name white supremacy or white privilege personally. <laughs> this really is about mm. ideology and to be able to hear it as a discussion about ideology and to feel oneself, yes, implicated, but we are all implicated. <laughs> this is not. And, and so the sense mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I earned everything I have and so forth, the, the sort of individually uh, defensive responses, I, I think, are what we have to get past. Uh, we have to get past just a little bit. In, you know, I, I could recommend all the usual things about, you know, reach out, you know, do you know, you know, do you have black friends or not, that sort of thing. But I actually think that what everybody can do is listen to the language, is really listen to the language of how we are seduced into creating our enemies. Um, because I don't think this is a natural division. I mean, I think uh, as, as, as Professor Panagopoulos said that we, you know, we, that, that, that 
that there's a way in which we are all hunters and we're in the wilderness and we are defense. But how this particular division came about is very culturally inflected and it's in our vocabulary, it's in our language. Um, so listen to our language. And I thought Donald Trump was masterful over the course of four years of talking about my people, my people, who was no longer, which was no longer we the people. And he slowly over time created a sense of identity in which you had to jump to one side or the other. And then mm -hmm. there was an embodied mm -hmm. nationality in that. Um, and then mm -hmm. every enemy then took on a body, an embodied uh, uh, identity, like the China virus, or, you know, mm -hmm. I think we did it with French fries before freedom fries or whatever, you know, that this kind of play with language is very, very powerful and inductive. And when it's, ex you know, mm -hmm. exacerbated by, um, um, by a lot of shouting and a lot of um, uh, technological communication. Um, what I was sensing and looking at, 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 at the events on January 6th was that it almost didn't matter what the object was, that the language mm. set up for this was an invitation to an emotional roller, to, 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 to the people were riding an emotional wave. I don't know if everybody mm. there really knew what their object was. <laughs> and that's the point mm. at which the object almost comes out in the embodiment of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. of, 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 you know, the hunt or the, you know, the, it's, it's when adrenaline takes over and the object mm -hmm. almost doesn't matter. I mm -hmm. worry about that. And, and that's why I think that as of the inauguration, a lot of people, I'm not alone, said my body unclenched the following morning. I wasn't hearing everything, mm -hmm. things. That, and it feels mm -hmm. like, as, as a friend of mine said, you know, it's like, an abusive husband or a, you know, a, a, a raging mm. parent was suddenly put in jail. Mm. And all of a sudden mm. we all felt something emotionally. W however, you know, whether we were fans of Donald Trump or not, there was, this, there was a relaxation into this space in which you could sort of feel your brain catching up with all of the emotions that we have all been writing. That emotional uh, part of it is something that I think is the most dangerous part of what's going on. Because then it can mm. be directed regardless. It's not about, you know, it's not about voting. It's about pedophiles in pizza stores. <laughs> and so I, this morning I was actually teaching an article on, on cooties, on the way children talk about cooties. And it's almost an emotional mm. practice. You mark somebody and it doesn't mm. have a particular definition. It's just that somebody is disgusting and revolting. And so you, you and it's shifting and it's malleable. And I think racism is like mm. that. But a lot mm. of constructions of our enemies um, within and mm -hmm. without national identity, nationalistic identitarianism um, mm -hmm. have that fluidity and can be, once you get into that adrenaline state, can be redirected um, um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the nonsensical lack of definition that, that with which we speak of cooties. Um, mm. Wow. Um, one more question for you, Professor Williams, and then I'll have a question to close this all out with. Um, and the question is, is white supremacy especially concerning in America? Are there lessons that America can view from other countries who've done a better job with white supremacy? If so, what, are, what lessons are those? Uh, again, I'm not a comparativist. I am not certain. I mean, I think there, we all, you know, it's, it's I, 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 you know, people were celebrating South Africa at one point. I think we are, we, 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 we have, there's a tendency to want to find wonderful models that solve our problems. And I think that as, as, as mm -hmm. Martin Luther King said, this is an endless moral challenge. We can't stop. Mm -hmm and look to, mm. to, to, you know, to the solution of it. But I do think that um, it's helpful to read books like Kathleen Ballou's book, uh, Bring Home the War, which is about the, resurgent, mm. uh, the resurgence of white nationalism and you know, sort of dating back to the Ku Klux Klan of white, what, of racist inspired uh, terrorism in this country. I find mm -hmm. it very helpful at this moment, particularly this moment, uh, and not to generalize and not to overstate the comparison with Weimar Republic, but uh, the philologist uh, Victor Klemperer uh, wrote a, 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 a series of books about the way, in, I think they were called um, uh, The Language of the Third Reich. And he shows how the meanings of words mm. changed in the decade before Hitler's rise. And those shifts in mm. inflection of what a particular word meant over time um, strikes me as very much what Donald Trump did with my people, my people, 
as it became narrower and narrower and excluded more and more, it, you know, it, it, it wasn't just mm -hmm. people who agreed with him, it became, you know, a, a, a tighter and tighter, uh, you know, a circle of, of, of those who are mm -hmm. with him and those who are against. And I think that that's, uh, that's what we can take lessons from. We can listen for that. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. whatever, you know, it's happened in Hungary, uh, perhaps it's mm -hmm. happening in Russia, but that's what we need to be careful of. And, and you can, there, there are scripts mm -hmm. that we can mm -hmm. be watchful for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is what we're gonna do. And I apologize to the audience. We still got questions coming in. There's no way we could get to all of them, uh, but we'll, we'll close out in the order that we started uh, with Professor Panagopoulos starting us out and then Professor Brunson and then Professor Wells and then of course Professor Williams can close this. The question is, the negative tensions won't disappear uh, and will probably come back in the future in some sort of form. How should society do a better job at recognizing hostility and prevent future outbreaks like what has happened? Well, you know, I think one thing that we can't do, uh, and there's a danger of doing, is to dismiss what happened and to sweep things under the rug. I think we've been we've been doing that for too long, and it's one of the dangers I think that the Congress, the Senate, is grappling with right now. Because uh, by um, you know by by conducting a trial against Donald Trump and and by finding him. Um, you know, innocent of these charges, the signal they might send is that, you know, it's okay, or it's not important enough for us to, to really take a firm stance against his role in this. Uh, and I think that that would be a very dangerous signal to send if, um, if, if the, uh, you know, uh, for, for the Senate to send. So one thing we can't do is, is sweep it um, under the rug. And I think that the more we talk about this, and the more we take not only a, a national, social, uh, and personal um, commitment to doing our part to address, particularly those of us who have um, enjoyed white privilege, to think about uh, the part that we will play in in our own lives to try to uh, dismantle uh, racist impulses and systemic racism that we see around us, even if it might be hard to do, uh, is, as I said in the chat, a necessary first step and, and something that we must all do as individuals and then as a nation. So I think that those... Um, those things might not um, solve the problem forever, but it, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no solution that will that will happen uh, if we don't at least start there. So those are some thoughts about um, mm -hmm. how we can at least embark on this journey. Mm -hmm. Professor Brunson, and I was saying, keeping with those comments, uh, I will you know draw on a, a quote from Martin Luther King. He said that riots are the language of the unheard. So again, you know the we don't address the issues and we have a history, a long history in this country of, of not addressing the source of, as I said earlier, people's pain. And we look at the symptoms and then we hope that that event goes away and then we'll have another event. And we tend to do the same things without having meaningful dialogue and thoughtful reflection on where we are as a country, why are we so divided and working to repair those uh, divides. Mm. So what else? So I will offer something just a little different. Uh, so I think one possible benefit um, in a perverse way of the events that happened is that we now take threats levied from the internet uh, writ large a little more seriously. Mm. So I hope that that transcends mm. um, into protections for, you know, for example, the women from Gamergate who are still being harassed, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that we take those threats more seriously mm -hmm. and develop uh, modes of law enforcement that take those threats seriously and still preserve the women's right to make a livelihood to uh, the data that they've generated and the identities that they have online. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that's true. Mm -hmm. I also think that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the folks in the audience, I bet we have some future social media company employees and uh, we certainly have users in the audience. So, so I think it is time to start applying social and economic pressure to these companies that we just won't stand for it when we see these kinds of coordinated harassment campaigns that we will not as mm. consumers, as potential future creators of these spaces, 
that we will find ways to take these threats seriously or take our money and business elsewhere, right? So until we have mm -hmm. effective law enforcement and effective laws to enforce, uh, we need mm -hmm. to, you know, exert the power that we have. Uh, so I hope, I hope mm -hmm. we see that moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one encouraging sign, if I could j jump in, um, sure, uh, sure. Professor, uh, Wells, is um, that uh, dozens of corporations have um, uh, now uh, stopped uh, directing their campaign contributions to members of Congress who objected hmm. to the Electoral College results, right? And that is a, a strong hmm. statement. Um, you know, lot these are major Fortune 500 companies uh, that are basically refusing to support these lawmakers um, financially uh, to, to take a stand. And I think that we're seeing that even corporate America is not shirking its responsibility to take uh, some action here and to send a strong signal that these, uh, these views are not, to, not tolerable. Mm. And, and I think and it says Professor a Williams. lot. I think it says a lot that we have come so far that we that you know that we have forgotten that we need to control those Fortune 500 <laughs> companies that are running our elections. Um, mm. We need electoral mm. reform at that level. I mean, certainly the access to the to the ballot, but uh, the, the, we we are living in a world in which money talks, and it's only money that's talking. And we had forms of regulation mm. at one point that were at least marginally better. Uh, I think we need to revisit some mm. of that. Um, I'm also a lawyer, I believe deeply in due process and the lack of due process that has characterized every aspect of the last four years um, was perhaps most, I mean, just in its simplest form uh, visible in the debates. You know, you have to cut off somebody's microphone sometimes. You have to actually put a limit on how much time you can talk. You have to give mm. voice to the other side. And it is as though we have lost that sense of what process is due to each of us as citizens mm. because money is so noisy and doing all the talking. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, we certainly want to thank our, our distinguished panelists. Uh, and I would like to invite Dean Puega or Dean Jose, if you guys wanted to have any closing words on this incredibly uh, deep and inspirational uh, discussion. Uh, I see Dean Puega. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to say um, to, um, to the audience and to the panelists, thank you for this. Um, um, important discussion for the divergent um, approaches that we also have seen. Um, and at the same time, I think for attention um, to ideology, emotion, trauma, and also um, policy, um, as um, Professor Williams just mentioned, due process. Um, we have really um, addressed a lot of difficult and um, very large um, issues here. While not very much talking about COVID at this time, but of course, I think we are also mm. aware um, that, that COVID um, has also um, highlighted the, the um, deep um, um, divisions and experiences that we have in this country. And I think so much of mm. what you have talked about today has pointed to us mm. um, having to do a combination of ideological analysis and policy change um, in order to, mm -hmm. to move forward. Mm. Again, just many, many thanks to the okay. panelists um, as well as to the audience um, from me. Bob, um, do you, are you able to unmute? Yeah. Uh, I, Dean, think we, Dean I, Jose, you there? I think we we'll let um, Dean Jose um, 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 <laughs> off. off the hook here. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> Director O'Brien, if I may just say that. Yeah. And, um, thank you <laughs> okay. um, for moderating our conversation today. And um, let yes. me perhaps also say um, there will, of course, be other moments, some of them in our, many of them, I'm sure, in our classroom many of them in the student activist groups uh, that we have on campus. We will also be running another racial literacy series um, this year. And so I would just encourage all of you to continue to get involved where you can get involved in um, asking big questions, but also finding local um, answers where we can make um, um, communities better, um, both here at Northeastern and in the communities that we interact with, um, be it in Boston or throughout our networks. Mm -hmm. So again, many thanks okay. to all of you. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dean Puega. 
I guess are we supposed to wave? Is this <laughs> all right? 